Welcome, everybody, to the TUT Colloquium. It is my great pleasure to introduce Sophie Spirkel. Um, Sophie recently joined the CNO department um, as a professor after doing postdocs at Rutgers and Princeton and obtaining her PhD from Princeton as well. Um, she will tell us today about pure pairs. Uh, so Sophie, take it away. Thank you. And thank you, Jorn, for serving as the host today for this talk. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. I know this is a time that many of you take off. So I appreciate that you're here and I hope you will like this talk. So pure pairs is something I've been working on with a number of people whose names are here for a while. And in fact, pure pairs are what I talked about when I interviewed at Waterloo um, a while back. So I thought it might be fitting to talk about it again and tell you basically where this project has gone since perhaps the last time I told you about it. So this is based on joint work with Maria Chudnovsky, Jacob Fox, Alex Scott, and Paul Seymour. And during some of the time I worked on it, I was supported by the National Science Foundation. And so let's get started, hopefully. Um, right, so this talk is about induced subgraphs. Um, Two weeks ago, I gave a talk about deletion and contraction, but this is not that talk. In this talk, deletion of edges and contraction of edges is not allowed. We care about induced subgraphs only. So if you have a big graph, then a small graph is an induced subgraph of it. If you can get there from the big graph just by deleting some vertices. And it's H3 if G does not contain H as induced subgraph. And sort of the big question then that we're after in this area is given some graph H, what do H free graphs look like? If I have a big H free graph, can I say something quantitative about its structure that distinguishes it just from a random graph? And so for some graphs H, we can actually say very explicitly what H free graphs look like. If I start with the simplest example where H is just a single end, I can actually point, here we go. Then clearly H free graphs are graphs that don't have edges. And that's a class we understand very, very well. If we make it a little more difficult and let H be this two edge path, then H free graphs are graphs such that every connected component is a clique, doesn't have any non edges, because if you imagine a connected component in such a graph and two vertices in it, take a shortest path between them. If that path has two or more edges, it contains H. So actually they're just adjacent and the whole component is a clique. And again, this is something that we understand and we know how to deal with for most questions. So we can make it even more complicated, look at a three edge path. And again, we have a description that I can you know, tell you very compactly, those graphs have the property that either the graph or its complement is not connected. And because we're excluding H as induced subgraph, the same property is true for every induced subgraph. And so in fact, you can build all H-free graphs just from single vertices by taking smaller H-free graphs and either taking their disjoint union with no edges between them, or by taking a disjoint union and putting all edges between them. So we understand them pretty well. And so this list is a pretty exhaustive list of which classes of H free graphs we have a structural description of. If we go to this one called the claw, I just put a description exists because it's a series of papers and it is not nearly as compact as the previous statements due to Chudnovsky and Seymour. And then this graph H called the bull for obvious reasons, also is a graph where we can describe H free graphs. And this is pretty much where it ends. If you look at a graph like this one, a five cycle, I mean, we can still say, okay, H free graphs are those that don't have this cycle, but we don't have a way to build them out of smaller components that we understand in any reasonable way. 
So if we want to say something about H-free graphs for H more generally, we kind of can't hope to have a precise structural description or decomposition theorem, but we can still look for large scale patterns. And something you see here already is that if you look at these graphs or those graphs, or even these graphs, there are large clusters of vertices such that either each pair of them is adjacent or no two of them are adjacent. Right, for example, in these kinds of graphs, if you have a big connected component, then each pair of vertices and it is adjacent. And if you have many connected components, then one vertex from each gives you a set with no two adjacent. And basically the conjecture is that that is always true in the following sense. So let us call a set of vertices such that every pair of them is adjacent a clique and a set of vertices so that no two of them are adjacent to a stable set. And then we say a class of graphs, which just means a set of graphs, has the other channel property or just EH property, because I used to give this talk on the board and it saved a lot of time. If there is a positive constant delta such that if I look at any n vertex graph in the class, it has a clique or stable set of size at least n to the delta. So delta is fractional, right? Delta is less than one usually, but this is still big in the sense that in a random graph, you wouldn't get this, right? If you take a random graph and put each edge in independently with probability a half, you expect cliques and stable sets to be at most of logarithmic size with high probability. So this property having such a big clique or stable set does distinguish graphs from just random graphs. And the conjecture is that this property is true for all H-free graphs, for every graph H. If you look at H-free graphs, there's some constant delta and it'll necessarily depend on H such that H free graphs have the other channel property with that constant. And this conjecture is hard and some cases of it have been proved. In fact, it is known for all graphs on this list for which a description exists. The first three have elementary proofs. This one I think the easiest proof is due to Alan Pach and Solimasi, and this one is Chudnovsky and Safra. But the last one, C5, we actually don't know the other channel conjecture for. So this conjecture is also still open for many simple cases. Simple in the sense that the graphs are simple, not that the proof is simple as far as we know. So we try to look at something slightly different and something that in the descriptions that I showed you also shows up, which is pure pairs and pure pairs is short for complete pairs or anti-complete pairs. A complete pair means two subsets of the vertex set such that between them all edges are present, which is different from a clique because in a clique I say all edges within are present, but here I only care about the edges between and not the edges within A or within B. They can be anything they want to be. And an anti-complete pair is exactly the same, except now you say there are no edges between them. And again, I don't care what happens within. And so A and B are a pure pair if they're one of those two things. And so in particular, a clique or a stable set gives you a pure pair by just splitting it down the middle. But there's hope that we can find larger pure pairs in graphs that are H-free. And to say things more compactly, we say a class of graphs is FG pure. If I can always find pure pairs within every graph in the class of size F of n and G of n, where n is the number of vertices in the graph. So one thing we'll look at is graphs that are epsilon n, epsilon n pure, meaning graphs where I can find a pure pair such that both A and B are of size a constant fraction of the vertex set. And this is somewhat nicely in between 
things in terms of the Edersheinel conjecture. Because if you look at the Edersheinel property, right, if a class of graphs has the Edersheinel property, always has those large cliques or stable sets, then it also has pure pairs that are of size n to the delta for some constant delta, just by taking the clique or stable set and splitting it in half. And on the other hand, there's a partial converse where if C is epsilon n, epsilon n pure, if you can always find a constant fraction of the vertex set for A and for B, for some positive epsilon, then the class has the Erdoshinal property. So pure pairs are sort of nicely in between things for the Erdoshinal conjecture. They could be used to prove the Erdoshinal property and on the other hand, their existence follows from it for vastly different constants. And perhaps additional good news is that at least this consequence of the Edersheinel conjecture that we have pure pairs of size n to the delta and n to the delta in H-free graphs is just true. This was proved by Edersheinel and Pach. And in fact, delta is not a terribly small constant. It's roughly one over the size of H. Unfortunately, pure pairs are probably not going to be how we prove the Edersheinel conjecture. Because if you just use pure pairs and the size of pure pairs you get as a black box, basically, then you really need linear size pure pairs. You really need epsilon n, epsilon n pure classes of graphs. But unfortunately, if you want H free graphs to be epsilon n, epsilon n pure, then H is an induced subgraph of a three edge path. And A for H free graphs when H is this graph, we already know the Edersheinel conjecture. In fact, those graphs are perfect, so they somehow very trivially satisfy the Edersheinel conjecture. But really the sort of reason behind this counter example is that there's a Erdős random graph construction of random graphs that are sparse and have high girth and still don't have linear size pure pairs, which means that the graph H you should exclude to get linear size pure pairs can't have a cycle. But the same construction, the complement also shows that its complement can't have a cycle. So the reason it's this three edge path, the thing that makes it special is that if you take this graph and its complement, which is why the thing is drawn twice here, they're actually isomorphic. And furthermore, you can think about all graphs such that either the graph nor its complement has a cycle and they will all be induced subgraphs of this. So, we have an exact answer for when there are linear size pure pairs in H-free graphs if you exclude one graph H, but unfortunately this exact answer is not exactly good news for the Edersheinel conjecture. And so one way to at least get a little bit closer is to think about sparsity. Right, this construction says that I can construct a sparse graph without linear size pure pairs and with high girth, so it won't contain any graphs that aren't forests, as in do subgraphs if I make the girth high enough. But in order to require that H and its complement have to be forests, don't have cycles, I need to look at sparse graphs and dense graphs. So we can do a bit better if we look at sparse graphs separately. And this is a very loose notion of sparse, where a graph is epsilon sparse if for each vertex its close neighborhood is at most a small constant fraction of the vertex set. And the reason we can look at these graphs is a theorem of Rodel that says basically H free graphs always have a big chunk that's either sparse or its complement is sparse. More precisely, if you pick the amount of sparsity you want, the parameter epsilon, then there is a delta. 
such that if I look at an n vertex h free graph, I can find within it an induced subgraph j that's still a constant fraction, just a delta fraction of the total vertex set, and such that either j or its complement attains my desired sparsity. And induced subgraphs somehow are very nice undertaking complements because if I look at j and it's h free, then j complement is h complement free. So often without loss of generality, we can just talk about sparse graphs here. Just keeping in mind though that we use this theorem. But this tells us that maybe we can think about sparse graphs and in sparse graphs, we don't have the restriction that we have to be a subgraph of the free edge path. Because in fact, for sparse graphs, it works for every forest, meaning for every forest F, every acyclic graph F, there is a positive epsilon such that epsilon sparse F free graphs have linear size pure pairs. And I wrote down here for you the history of the order in which this was proved. This was first proved in a really nice proof for pants by Bosquet, Legut, and Thomasay. And then it was proved for hooks, which is a path with one extra vertex, two removed from one end. And then it was proved for caterpillars, which are a path with, with a bunch of leaves everywhere. And finally for force. And that's best possible in the sense that if you exclude something that's not a force, then this conclusion isn't true. So what we saw in the slide about a three edge path is a complete answer to when do H free graphs have linear size pure pairs and what you see on this slide is a complete answer to when do sparse H free graphs have linear size pure pairs. It's if and only if H is a force. And while this doesn't directly imply any case of the other time of conjecture, it does imply that you exclude, if you exclude both a forest and the complement of a forest, then that class of graphs has the outer channel property. And so, right, in fact, the previous slide doesn't just answer this if you exclude one graph, it also answers it for finite families, which means the only other ways we might hope to get epsilon and epsilon in pure classes of graphs is excluding more than one graph and in fact excluding an infinite family of graphs. And so somehow a very natural way to do that is to look at subdivisions of H, which means graphs that you get from H by taking each edge and putting any number of vertices inside of it. And so now we can hope that maybe if you exclude all subdivisions of H, you still get linear size pure pairs. And you do. So again, we need to assume sparsity. Because while H free graphs and their subdivisions contain graphs of arbitrarily large birth, we haven't looked at the complements yet and haven't made sure of that for a complement. But it's again true for sparse graphs. So if you look at sparse graphs and you exclude all subdivisions of a graph H, you again get linear size pure pairs, which at this point seems like we're more and more introducing conditions to make this thing true, which is why I was very happy that actually this proof has an application. And Chudnovsky and Ohm proved that this implies the outer channel conjecture if you remove the word induced subgraph and put in the, ver the word vertex minor. So if you have a graph H and you exclude it as a vertex minor, then that class of graphs has linear size pure pairs and therefore has the outer channel property. And well, many of you probably know what a vertex minor is. Let me just briefly say it. So vertex minor means that you can obtain it from the containing graph 
by vertex deletion, right, just like into subgraphs and a thing called local complementation, which means you look at any vertex in the graph, look at its neighborhood and replace the induced subgraph within its neighborhood by its complement, which is less restrictive than induced subgraphs and has the special property that if you contain an induced subdivision of H, then you contain H as a vertex minor just by looking at the intermediate vertices within an engine doing local complementation at each of them in order. So this theorem actually found use and helps us help Janowski and Owen prove that for vertex minor free graphs, the outer channel conjecture holds. But this is where we are with linear size pure pairs, which means now we should ask about other sizes of pure pairs. And so polynomial and linear are sort of the two natural sizes of pure pairs to think about, which made a natural intermediate question, this one asking, when can we get pure pairs where one set is polynomial in size and the other is linear? And so this is the question we thought about next. This question is actually due to Conlon, Fox and Sudikoff who conjectured that this is always true in for every graph H, there exists epsilon and delta such that H free graphs have pure pairs with one of polynomial size and one of linear size. Which would be really nice, right? The previous slide shows you that epsilon n, epsilon n pure is a property that characterizes in sparse graphs at least that you're excluding a forest and it would be nice for the other two to be true for all graphs, especially because the last one just follows from um, fairly simple proofs for finding an induced subgraph and also that one is strictly weaker than the outer channel conjecture. So this middle one being true for all graphs would be a nice result, but we can't prove it for um, a triangle, which is kind of frustrating, but let me first tell you what we can prove. We can prove in sparse graphs that if what you're excluding is almost bipartite, then you get a pure pair with one size, set of polynomial size and the other of linear size. And an almost bipartite graph means basically a bipartite graph, except on one side you're allowed to put up to a matching in terms of edges. And then you'll notice actually a triangle meets this definition. So you also have to add the graph is triangle free. But then this inc includes graphs such as C5, a five cycle, and also every at least one subdivision of a graph. So includes some fairly rich classes of graphs. But again, it kind of suffers from the fact that if we want a graph that's almost bipartite and its complement also is almost bipartite, because remember to assume sparse, we might have to go to the complement, then we don't have many options because all such graphs are induced subgraphs of C5 unless n or C4 or the complement of C4. So the options are a bit limited for graphs such that this will actually say something about H3 graphs in general omitting the word epsilon sparse. But this, and here I'm lying a bit, but the proof techniques used to get this result lets us prove a better, prove a better approximation to Edersheimer. So this table is 
lie in the sense that the results on the left don't imply the results on the right. But usually the proof techniques allow us to prove similar results that do give us that implication. And so the techniques that were used for all graphs to prove that we get pure pairs of size n to the delta on both sides actually allow us to prove that something close to the Erdős-Heinel conjecture is true. And by us, I mean Erdős-Heinel and Pach proved that if you look at H-free graphs, at least there is a constant C such that they always have a clique or stable set of size 2 to the C times root log n, which is some evidence towards the Erdős-Heinel conjecture because, right, if you recall, in random graphs, we expect cliques or stable sets to be of size closer to log n. So this first result at least shows us that something like the Erdős-Heinel conjecture is happening. There are bigger cliques or stable sets there than we would expect in general. And using our proofs for this almost bipartite case, we proved a variant of these pure pair results that lets us show four graphs such that they are almost bipartite and so are their complements. That we actually get a clique or stable set of size this wonderful expression, which is two to the C root log n times log log n. And if you look at the Erdős-Heinel conjecture, right, what it requires is n to the delta, which is two to the C times log n, meaning that this first result was off from the conjecture by a square root, and now we're off from the conjecture by this log, which seems worse, but it's actually better. And this is true, you get this result whenever you exclude an almost bipartite graph and the complement of an almost bipartite graph, but the only graph that satisfies this and for which the Erdős-Heinel conjecture is still open is C5. So, in terms of using pure pairs to make progress for Erdős-Heinel and just excluding a simple, single graph, this is the only part where we actually improve the knowledge towards just plain Erdős-Heinel by saying, well, for C5, we can get a little bit closer to the conjectured truth. And so another question that kind of comes from this random construction is saying, you know, there's still a gap, right? Sometimes we can get linear, but we're very rarely, and always we can get polynomial size pure pairs, but when can we get pure pairs of polynomial size and not just any polynomial, but the exponent at least gets very, very close to one? When can we at least somehow move towards linear size pure pairs, even if we can't get there? And if you do the random construction, there's a relation between that and the girth of a graph, because the higher you want to make the girth of your random graph, the sparser it has to be, and so the larger the pure pairs that do occur in that graph. And from that, you can show that if H has girth K, a cycle of length at most K, then H-free epsilon sparse graphs don't admit pure pairs of size n to the one minus delta on both sides if delta is less than one over K. Right, so shorter cycles in H means you won't get large pure pairs. And on the other hand, the higher the girth of H, the better at least the hope is for pure pairs, which is not entirely factual. The actual relation is not between the girth of H, but between the congestion of H, which means essentially some rearranging of the edge density. If you look at a tree, the edge density is very small. You have roughly one edge per vertex, and so you can get linear size pure pairs, and the size of pure pair we know you can't get is related to that edge density. 
and the slightly precise formula is here in orange. This is how far off you might be from linear size pure pairs. This is what you think of as what you should think of as delta. And hopefully if I did it right for a tree, this is essentially zero. And then for other graphs, you can tell how far off you'll be by looking at the edge density. And so from the random construction, we know that how close delta can get is related to the congestion. If the congestion is reasonably big, then delta has to be reasonably big. But there's also a converse, and that's what this says. So let's say it carefully. We know that congestion gives a sort of a upper bound for how big pure pure pairs can be. But it's also true the other way around. If I say I want a pure pair of size n to the 1 minus delta n to the 1 minus delta in h-free graphs, then there is a congestion bound c such that if the graph I exclude has congestion at most c, then epsilon sparse h-free graphs have these pure pairs which is a complicated way of saying we have a converse up to um, factors between how delta and C are actually related. Thus says that if we're fine tuning the size of the pure pair you can get, the exponent you can get is exactly up to the dependence between delta and C determined by congestion congestion zero trees, linear size pure pairs. But if your congestion is very close to zero, you can still get somewhat close to linear size pure pairs. And one consequence of this that's a bit unexpected maybe is about perfect graphs. So perfect graphs are graphs such that their clique number is their chromatic number, and the same is true for every induced subgraph. But in terms of the other channel conjecture, there are graphs that always either have a clique or a stable set of size at least root n. So perfect graphs, in terms of the other channel conjecture, are very well-behaved class of graphs, and they satisfy it basically trivially. But Perfect graphs don't have linear size pure pairs. There's a construction due to Fox that shows this. In fact, not just a perfect graph, but he gives a comparability graph. So it's a graph whose properties otherwise we understand pretty well, but they don't have linear size pure pairs. And in fact, he showed that they don't have pure pairs of size and over log n roughly on each side. So the question is, well, is it at least close to linear? Or is there in fact a different bound? And well, we didn't really get to n over log n, at least we showed that for every positive delta, there is an epsilon such that you can get pure pairs of size epsilon n to the one minus delta on each side in perfect graphs. Which is nice, it shows that we are at least close to optimal here. We know we can't get linear, but we can get n to any exponent less than one. And the reason for this is actually easy, assuming the strong perfect graph theorem, because perfect graphs don't have odd induced cycles of length at least five and also not their complements, which means they have forbidden induced subgraphs with congestion going to zero. 
both in the graphs and the complements. So this actually follows from the previous results. And so this construction of our perfect graphs is actually a construction for ordered graphs. An ordered graph is just a graph where you also put its vertices in a linear order and then an induced subgraph should be contained in its given order, right, in the natural way. And one reason to look at ordered graphs is that the outer channel conjecture is actually equivalent if you say it for graphs or for ordered graphs due to a result of Allen Krah and Solimosi, which just says that for each ordered graph, you can construct a large enough graph such that any way you ordered it, ordered it, it contains the small ordered graph in its correct order again. But this is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? There's no direct pairing between graphs saying, if it works for this ordered graph, then it works for this graph and vice versa. It's just if it's true for all graphs, it's true for all ordered graphs. And so we started looking at pure pairs for ordered graphs to see what still works and what now doesn't work. And well, first, this is a theorem that already shows you that we might have a bit of a harder time. But so Pach and Tomon proved that for ordered graphs, if I exclude an induced monotone k-vertex path, which is a path like this, right, where all its vertices are in the natural order, and its complement, then you get the outer channel property. Which is interesting in part because the result I told you about on the previous slide, Fox's construction of comparability graphs, doesn't even contain this ordered graph, the first three vertices of this path. So while in general graphs, excluding a forest and its complement gives you linear size pure pairs, in ordered graphs, it's a bit harder. Even if you have a sparse ordered graph, excluding just this two edge path in this order doesn't give you linear size pure pairs. So what is true in ordered graphs? We can again ask, when do we get linear size pure pairs? And again, I'm going to assume that we look at sparse graphs. From graphs, we inherit the first bullet point that we shouldn't have a cycle because the same random graph construction still works. But by the construction of Fox, containing this two-edge ordered path now also doesn't give you linear size pure pairs. We can also show that if you exclude this claw, you don't get linear size pure pairs. And also these three orderings of a three inch path, each of them excluding is, doesn't give you linear size pure pairs. So looking at this list, you might be wondering what graphs are actually left. Well, there's two connected graphs that are left now. Um, one of them is this one a two edge path, but not in order, but alternating. And if you exclude this from ordered graphs, I miss the word sparse here, but it's actually also true if you don't say sparse, then you get linear size pure pairs. And the reason is that if you look at a epsilon sparse graph that doesn't have linear size pure pairs, then we can apply the subdivisions result or even more simply we can apply that there is a long hole or breaking it down even further we can say there is a hole because chordal graphs you can convince yourself have linear size pure pairs so you look at an induced cycle of length more than three and you say great let's draw it in its order and let's look at the leftmost vertex then here is exactly the induced subgraph we wanted to find. What a mess, right? The other thing we could prove for all forests and for this thing, even to prove it for this two-edge path, which is somehow a really tiny graph, we go through this machinery of saying, well, 
subdivisions, or at least there's a long hole somewhere. And then look at the leftmost vertex, and there's this one little graph that we're trying to find. But at least it's true for this force. And this is the biggest connected graph for which we know it to be true. And we don't have the answer yet for this forage path, for vertex path, in this order, and also some disconnected graphs you get by taking their unions. So that's kind of surprising, I think, that linear size pure pairs and normal graphs has a sort of nice answer in saying it's a property of force if you look at sparse graphs. And here, for ordered graphs, it basically never happens. So in ordered graphs, we again get polynomial size pure pairs, this result, because their proof of this is so robust, it actually gives the graph H an order or the pure pair we're looking for. And linear size pure pairs, as we, as we just said, basically never happen, although they do happen for this graph by the previous slide and also excitingly when we reverse this order. And graphs whose every component is at most a single inch. It's open for basically this path and some disconnected graphs and not true otherwise. So again, we can ask the intermediate question, the Kalman Fox Sudikov conjecture about getting pure pairs where one side is linear and the other side is polynomial. And by the same equivalence that is between Edersheinl and ordered Edersheinl, this would actually follow if the unordered conjecture was true for all graphs. But we don't know if it's true for our graphs because we don't know if it's true for a triangle, which is the same as an ordered triangle. So here we're sort of stuck at the same point. We know it's true for red partite graphs. We know it's open otherwise, and we think maybe it's always true. So the next thing we did is say, well, what happens to force? Right, they gave us linear size pure pairs in unordered graphs, sparse unordered graphs. So do we at least get something good in ordered graphs? And well, what we can prove is at least this, if you pick a small enough delta, well, any delta you want, then we get pure pairs of size n to the one minus delta and n to the one minus delta. For every force, delta should be positive. So while we don't get linear size pure pairs anymore, at least it's close to this again. And, and, and that's probably what we expected because the only construction we have is this congestion thing and Fox's conjecture construction, but force don't have any congestion, so we would hope that somehow a similar thing is true. And in fact, it might be true that on one side we can put epsilon n for this result, but we don't know. So in ordered graphs, we also have something that's only true for force and not true otherwise, but it's not linear anymore. It's we can get as close to linear as we want to. So next, we looked at bipartite graphs. Now, bipartite graphs have linear size pure pairs, as you can convince yourself, because they consist of two stable sets. So each of them split in half gives you a linear size pure pair, which means for bipartite graphs, we care about pure pairs that have one side on one side of the bipartition and the other on the other. You're not allowed to say, take half of this, half of that, here's a pure pair. So we only look at the ones that go across. And again, we can ask which things still work and which things don't. And while it didn't work for ordered graphs, at least for bipartite graphs, the forest result is still true. If you have a sparse bipartite graph and you exclude a forest, 
you get linear size pure pairs. And again, it's not true if you exclude something that's not a forest. And while this is still true, and many of the ideas are similar, the proof doesn't just carry over. It somehow requires some different steps in there that don't quite just translate from the non-bipartite setting. But the reason I talked about bipartite graphs is because I want to talk about ordered bipartite graphs. So in an ordered bipartite graph, you put an order on each side of the bipartition, but they are not comparable to each other, which means you are essentially talking about a zero one matrix. And the containment relation is again into subgraphs, which just means you can cross out rows and columns from this matrix. And so then the conjecture is still about forests. This conjecture of Karandi, Pak, and Tomon, in fact, says if we have an order by bipartite graph and a forest, right, meaning we have a graph F and it's it has an assigned by partition and an assigned ordering, but it's also a forest. Then if we exclude it and it's complement from an ordered bipartite graph, we get linear size pure pairs. And so this is what would be true if we removed the word ordered bipartite from this statement. It's true if we look at general graphs, but for ordered bipartite graphs, it's still open. And just to make the complement sensible here, we're looking at the bipartite complement. You know, to form the complement, you don't put edges within the bipartitions. And so from what we know about graphs, the following conjecture would be sensible, although they didn't quite make this conjecture. So I will call it their conjecture if it's true and otherwise you can say it's mine. Um, but the conjecture that would be natural given what we know is maybe it's true that if we just exclude an ordered bipartite graph that's a forest from a sparse graph, then we get linear size pure pairs. But again, this is hard and somehow the situation seems similar to ordered graphs and then we can prove it for very tiny ordered bipartite graphs. We can prove it for this three edge path and the two edge matching and the one edge matching with two vertices. So in matrix terms, the two by two matrices that don't just all have the same number in every position. But we don't have something that works for bigger force and gives us linear size pure pairs. On the other hand, though, we also don't have the counter examples. They do not translate from ordered graphs. So this could still be true. But like in ordered graphs, at least what we can do and what works kind of similar to ordered graphs is getting close to linear size pure pairs. Meaning if we exclude an ordered bipartite graph, that's a forest from a sparse ordered bipartite graph, we get pure pairs where one side is linear and the other side might not be linear, but it can be as close to linear as you want. You know, it can be into the one minus delta where delta is any constant bigger than zero you choose. So ordered bipartite graphs seem to work more like ordered graphs than like bipartite graphs so far. Um, the one nice thing about bipartite graphs is that they don't contain triangles. So they don't contain the problematic graph we have for proving the conjecture of Conlon, Fox, and Sudakov, meaning an ordered bipartite graph. If we exclude any ordered bipartite graph H, we get pure pairs of size into the delta on one side and epsilon n on the other. So these, this conjecture of Conlon, Fox, and Sudikov is true for ordered bipartite graphs and actually fairly easy to prove for ordered bipartite graphs. So 
At least this is one thing that works better in ordered bipartite graphs than in general. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you again for coming today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask out loud or in the chat. Thank you, Sophie, for a very interesting talk. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask or type it into the chat and I will read it for you. I have a question myself, actually. Um, you, you have a large number of results that are of the form. There exists some epsilon, uh, possibly dependent on graphs and deltas and so on. Um, I was wondering if you have actual quantitative bounds on these epsilon as well. Usually not. It's a good question and a good point and certainly something one could try to do, but Generally, what we do is first we use this theorem of Rodels, which secretly uses the regularity lemma, and so all the constants are terrible. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. One, one could try, and it's an interesting way to go, but we haven't at all optimized the constants because our step one is to make all the constants be terrible. All right, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Sophie? All right, I have a question. Uh, so James Davies and I have been looking at this question. I think it's conjectured by Bartosz Valsak and Ispan Tomon. And it's if, if you exclude uh, any ordered matching, is it true that you're chi bounded? And so I didn't realize that the uh, epsilon and pure pairs uh, were known whenever you exclude a matching. And I guess I wonder if you've thought about the chi boundedness problem at all. I haven't. Also, a lot of it is qualified by in a sparse graph. So it is true that if you have a sparse graph and exclude a matching, you get linear size pure pairs. But if it's not a sparse graph, then it's not true. But yes, it's a good question. And it is true that a lot of the proofs kind of feel like high boundedness proofs. But in chi-boundedness, there's not a real good use for the outcome. There are two big parts of the graph with big chromatic number and no edges between them. Thank you. Although probably you could prove that if you wanted to for excluding an ordered metric. Are there any other questions? Okay. There's a question in the chat from Sopair. Um, does the result on perfect graphs hold for odd free odd whole free graphs as well? It actually doesn't because because we have this first step of using the theorem of Rodels to make things sparse, but it might mean going to the complement. And so if we go to the complement then we're not excluding something of small congestion. The reason perfect graphs work is because even if we go to the complement, we're still excluding all odd holes, and so we're excluding something of arbitrarily small congestion. But if we just say odd hole free, it doesn't work. And maybe it isn't true by the random graph construction. Although I'm not sure how to make. Yes, yeah, so if you make the random graph construction, you have no triangles and no C5, and then go to the complement. It should be odd hole free. There are no uh, further questions then. Let's thank Sophie again. Uh, thanks Sophie for a very interesting talk. Thank you.